You're listening to I Have Some Notes, a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. Greg, what about a movie based on the game Tomb Raider, starring Angelina Jolie? Oh yeah, a big popular video game with a sexy female lead. Wait, aren't video game movies notoriously terrible? Yes. Right. I have some notes. Welcome, everyone, to I Have Some Notes, the movie podcast with cuts, keeps, punch-ups, and tweaks on mediocre movies as suggested by you. I'm your host, Liam Kreswick. I'm Scott C. Bourgeois. I'm Greg Beaver. And today we are discussing Laura Croft, colon, Tomb Raider. Suggested, of course, by uh, a listener, uh, Derek Yeg um, suggested this one. Thanks, Derek. Uh, you also suggested the other Tomb Raider. Uh, I think just just one's good. Thanks. One helping, please. <laughs> I think I would have rather have watched the other one again. Oh, really? Because yeah, you had mentioned the the the, the more recent one it was was sort of also a, a bit of a, a, a non-starter. Ah, uh, I don't know if it's a, no. It's it's fine. It's it's. Like, uh, Laura Croft Tomb Raider isn't necessarily an uh, unwatchable film. Yeah. But, like, I did I did enjoy Tomb Raider, the Alicia Vikander one, a little bit more. Well, I guess to, to kick things off, I, uh, how how are you two with familiarity with the game? Um, it, was, it was never one I uh, played a lot of, um, but are either of you big Tomb Raider fans? I flirted with the game when it came out. Um, I didn't really get into it, and I never really got hooked into the franchise, but I'm familiar with it. Like it's, it's in the zeitgeist. If you're familiar with video games, you know who Lara Croft is. You know what the Tomb Raider games are. You've, you've seen footage of the, the recent reboots of it. Uh, so I think, I think it's safe to say that I, I am knowledgeable about Tomb Raider, even though I did not play them extensively. Yeah. I, uh, I'd never hit the ground running with Lara Croft. Um, so I wasn't, I, I didn't have a PC growing up. So, well, I did, but I wasn't capable of games. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So, so, uh, so I didn't really get uh, any exposure to it early on. Uh, and then I just kind of missed it, uh, right up until the, the, the bigger remake, um, that I think was yeah, in around 2011, right? Yeah, 2013. 2013, right. right. Yeah. Um, so th- that's sort of my exposure to the character. But by, by that time, I think the series had, um, undergone a lot of, uh, shifts and in influence from the Uncharted series. So I'm not sure how accurate, uh, it is to the original spirit of the, of Tomb Raider. Yeah, that's, that's fair. I realized I was like, oh yeah, I've never really played any of them. Like, oh wait, no, I had a person I used to live with played through, uh, most of the, the most recent one. Uh, and I, I was privy to that. Uh, I remember the, the, the bullet effects being very like, she takes a lot of bullets for someone in a tank top. Uh, like. <laughs> the the funny thing about you mentioning that the newer Tomb Raider has influence from Uncharted is that Uncharted has influence from the original Tomb Raider. So it's That's just totally it's fair, just yeah. a snake eating its own tail. Um, <laughs> Tomb Raider influenced Uncharted. Uncharted influenced Tomb Raider. So I just assume that the next Uncharted reboot is going to be influenced by the new Tomb Raider reboot, and it's just going to be a continuous cycle. Oh, I hope they don't make more Tomb Raider movies influenced by the Uncharted movie. That's, that's, uh, yeah. I, yeah, I definitely hope they don't make more Uncharted movies too, because yeah, that no one, one suggests was, that no good. <laughs> I have a sneaking suspicion it will probably be a movie we do on this podcast at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to that end, I watched Lightyear this weekend. It was they, my only hesitancy was like, I'm probably gonna have to watch this for the podcast again later. <laughs> I don't want to have. Then like, yeah, that's kind of got to be a car- part of the calculation now because like when you do watch, like it's good, <laughs> it's good to research some of these movies and like this might, you know, I want to see if this is good fodder for the for the podcast. But then th- there's that s- realization later on, like, oh, I have to watch this twice. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, the, either the sooner or the far later we could do Lightyear, that'd be swell. But of course, we're not uh, talking about Lightyear, we're talking about Laura Croft colon Tomb Raider on today's episode, uh, released in 2001, directed by Simon West. Bold of him to put a character with uh, the same <laughs> last name as him in the movie. Um, written by Sarah B. Cooper, Mike Werb. I like that name, Werb. Uh, and <laughs> Michael Collery. Um, based on the video game Tomb Raider, of course. Starring Angelina Jolie as the titular uh, uh, left half of the colon, Laura Croft. Uh, John Voight as uh, old Dick Croft. <laughs> Dick Croft I'm never going to not say Richard. Um Ian Glenn, is that how you say that guy's name? Yeah. Yeah, I think yes, so. Yes, three vowels in a row, that usually doesn't. But yeah, Ian Glenn uh, as Manfred Powell. <gasps> Manfred's my cat's name. Uh, <laughs> Noah Taylor as Bryce. And uh, a young Daniel Craig as Alex West, star of, uh, obviously, uh, Knives Out. I think we all know Daniel Craig from. Yeah, Ian Glenn has had a recent uh, kind of renaissance because he was in Game of Thrones as Jorah Mormont. Uh, but he is now much older and more grizzled than the young, dashing Ian Glenn, who is the uh, smooth snake Manfred Powell in this movie. I did not recognize him. Yeah, As no, he said that sentence. I googled him. Was like <gasps> Game of Thrones. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah no. One of the best Game of Thrones characters. He's he's virtually unrecognizable in this movie, which I I mean as a compliment, actually. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, and as you say, a surprise young Daniel Craig pre Bond. Mm-hmm. Though I did, this movie, I don't think it was just because Daniel Craig is in it. This movie reminded me a lot of the Pierce Brosnan era James Bond movies. Um, I don't yeah. know if it's just that era of filmmaking or just like some of the some of the um, action direction really seemed like it came out of that. And then, as I was looking up stuff about this movie, according to Wikipedia, a good chunk of this movie, if it was shot in the studio, it was shot in the 007 studio. That doesn't surprise me. Oh, really? This movie, yeah. I, as we were watching it, I, I texted Greg and Liam and said, this is the most 90s movie ever to come out in 2001. Because um, <laughs> it, 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 Liam was absolutely right. It felt like those 90s Brosnan James Bond movies. It felt like a 90s action movie. Yeah, and mm-hmm. that... I don't know that that's necessarily to the movie's credit. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it, it has really... that sort of goofiness that uh, that uh, the later '90s action flicks had. Uh, you know, it, it feels it feels more Batman and Robin than it does The Matrix, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, also, and uh, this might be t- kind of tiptoeing into things we didn't like about the movie already, but did the movie seem really cheap to you? Because I felt like the production design was really, really cheap looking throughout the whole film. Like the sets looked really setty, the props looked mm-hmm. really proppy, and it. I kept thinking this this looks like an episode of Tia Carrere's Relic Hunter show. Like it has that TV production value, and yeah. like it had a one hundred and fifteen million dollar budget. Did all of that money go to Angelina Jolie? <laughs> I mean, it's possible. Yeah, or the, I would... the effects team, or the like, because they they're really proud of their their robots and statues. Yeah. That maybe they had to shell it out for. Yeah, yeah. I suppose the robot looked all right, but um, you know, most of the other effects are, are. There was some effects that I was I was saying to Aaron that looked like they were straight out of Star Trek Next Generation. Like there's those auroras in the in the climax that are coming off of the the globe, the spinning globe things that we never get an explanation for what they are. Uh, and yeah, it's just like they they look like uh, one of those god type aliens from Star Trek. Yeah, that's fair. I I see. I did like the big the big statues in Cambodia because it. I don't know if it was something they did deliberately, um, but the the perspective of her interacting with that giant statue. And kind of the way it moved weirdly looked like super old Ray Harryhausen, um, <laughs> oh, yeah. like Clash yeah. of the Titans, that kind of like uncanny jerkiness yeah. um, that I, I found quite endearing that those those two parts might have been my favorite. So that part of the part with the, the swinging log and then into the statues well, might have been my favorite part. I had so. joked at that part uh, with the Greg and Liam <laughs> that just once I'd like to see an archaeologist in a tomb, in a movie, <laughs> and some magic happens, and the archaeologist is like, what is happening? Why is magic real? 
uh, because <laughs> in, in every movie, some magic happens in the tomb, and the archaeologist is just like, yeah, magic happens, whatever. Like, to- it's not even, it's just Tuesday for the archaeologist. And both Angelina Jolie and Daniel Craig, archaeologists in this film, see actual magic and are just like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> On, I didn't know what that was in reference to because you watched it before before us. I didn't know where you were in the movie when you said that. But there is a point in the movie where Daniel Craig looks at some magic happening and goes, holy shit, it's in Act 3. But he does react to Craig and go, holy shit. Yeah, but this is, and of three. course, this is after he's seen magic animate statues. Yeah. So now, and now he's surprised. <laughs> Surprised by surprised. something, yeah, yeah. Uh, I do want to go back to your comment about how it looked kind of cheap. I I think when this movie was at its best, it did kind of feel like a video game. Um, like the way the that that third act set piece really had a lot of like jumping involved and like timed jumping was like a great way to make <laughs> feel something feel like a video game is have your characters make timed jumps. <laughs> um, but the part when it was at its worst, it it did look cheap in the way. It felt like an interactive theme park ride. Okay. Yeah. Like it felt like yep. one of those yeah. like amusement park attractions where there's a lot of video involved. And it's like yeah. Kind of what it felt. It was it, it Yeah, that's a weird. that's a pretty apt analogy. I think that, that hits it spot on. Maybe not cheap, but fake. It mm-hmm. felt very fake. Yeah. 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 Like the movie was made at Galaxy Land in West Edmonton Mall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh well the why don't we why don't we Hit the trailer here, get a little more grounding on the, the rich story being uh, woven here, and then we'll, we'll come back to some further thoughts. We are running out of time. And if we fail, we must wait another 5,000 years. Well, I don't know about you, but that's more time than I'm prepared to commit to this enterprise. This summer... The planets will align. It was the Illuminati who swore to bring their ancestors back to life. Time will stand still. Have you ever heard of the Clock of Ages? It gives its possessor the power of the light. And the fate of mankind. Eternal hell revive! Will rest in the hands of one. Mm, don't start. You can build. Destroy, move back and forth through time. The future is yours now, Lara. We're the only one with the strength to destroy the power of the light. We can be partners. You might try to kill me. I'm not going to kill you. I said you'd try. Consummate colonialist and rich orphaned badass, Lara Croft alights upon a ticking clock hidden underneath her mansion's stairwell. The clock contains an ancient artifact left by her father that is the key to finding an equally ancient triangle with the power to grant godhood. The Triforce of Power, or whatever it is, is also highly sought after by a mysterious group of triangle worshippers known as the Illuminati, and they will stop at nothing to acquire Croft's artifact. She must work quickly to ensure the power of the triangle doesn't fall into the wrong hands. Why doesn't she simply destroy the artifact? Who can say? I mean, she does at the end. Yeah. I mean, I guess. I mean, it, if she if she destroyed it immediately when she knew it was uh, something dangerous, it was problem solved. <laughs> the yeah, problem the beginning of the MacGuffins. Movie. Like you can't really. Like. <laughs> but but before she, before then, she wanted to use its power to bring back her dead daddy. So she couldn't just destroy it early on. She had to have that final one-on-one where he assured her it was okay to, to not have him come back that she found the power inside of her to destroy it. And I hate that by the way, I absolutely hate that her entire motivation is tied up with a man. Mm, Yeah. It's funny that you say that because I kind of didn't really pick up on that. I kind of felt like she was just like walking around just like, I'm going to get it. I didn't, I didn't like, I, I suppose I must have missed somewhere where they say it expressly that that was her that was her motivation. But I mean, yeah, it, from from her motivation to wanting to use its power to bring him back to him being the person who sets her on the journey in the first place, and her mm-hmm. kind of picking up on his on his uh, quest to find it, and him leaving her clues on how to find it. Her dad drives the whole story for her, and she sure. has yeah, and she has no motivation of her own, and that is really gross to me and i hate it thanks movie that's fair and so Um, like one of the things that i'm gonna just straight up say right now that i'm cutting from this movie is john (laughs) voight 
Um, that, that it's interesting because I, 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 what I found interesting about the dad subplot is early on she's looking at his tomb or his tomb. Good lord, but like, she looks at a lot of tombs. Yeah. And that's not one of them. Uh, his his grave. Um, looking at his grave and it says "lost in the field" and then the day he died, mm-hmm. um, gone but not forgotten. And I'm like, oh, this is early in the movie. I'm like, oh, he's gonna be alive. He's gonna show up at the end of the movie alive. Of course, why right. would they say lost in the field if he wasn't going to... And then he actually is dead. Spoiler alert, he's... he's. I mean, maybe I haven't seen the <laughs> second one. I'm sure they bring him out in the second one. Maybe that's even why they put that on the tombstone. So they had a, um, Sean Connery to bring into the, the inevitable third one, like Indiana <laughs> Jones. Um, but yeah, they, they, the dad is dead. And I fully thought at some point he was going to show up and we're all going to go, oh, he's alive! And they didn't do that. So at least I liked that in that regard. But Fair. you are correct in that this movie fails the Bechdel test in that she is the only other woman in this. She's the only woman in this movie. Yeah. And and yeah. her entire motivation is tied up with finishing a man's work to bring that man back to life. Um, <laughs> and then has to choose between bringing that man back to life and a different man she cares about back to life. So, you know, Super. Yeah. Great, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You, you yeah. remarked that like her, her dad left her a bunch of clues and I don't know, like I'll, I'll take issue with that slightly, uh, because I feel like all, all that really, all she really left her was like a big exposition dump. Like yeah. he, he <laughs> left her, he left her a poem and I was like, yeah. oh, okay. So she's gonna, she's, the poem's gonna be like coded and she has to like figure out the code and do some smart archaeology stuff or whatever. And then she's gonna find where this, you know, triangle thing is or whatever. Nope. Uh, we just get like a weird cutscene, uh, I don't know, flashback slash montage of basically her dad just telling, revealing the entire backstory to the, to the, uh, the, triangle of power and yeah. you get no there's no intrigue or fun um and the the sequence is um i don't know the, the sequence itself is pretty uh boring as well like there's just n- nothing going on so it's a very very strange decision you yeah. know just to like eh. yeah there's no mystery for her to, to the solve. letter no are you referring to the letter, like the the, yeah, the yeah, tiny yeah. letter that arrives? Yeah, that was that was trash. I it, it, like because the <laughs> other thing is it it shows this is part of my fixes, but it shows up a day late. The clock starts ticking. She finds it. She goes and shows it to all the bad guys because she doesn't know what it is. And then they they make a big stink about how it is a like on the very day he meant to send it. This letter arrives with all the expo- exposition she needed twenty four hours ago. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it's it's ham fisted at best, and it has like that a sort of like let's get on with it quality, uh, you know, like yeah. you know, just uh, yeah. a, a, a script writer just taking a big old shortcut just to get to, I guess, the action. Yeah, it really it's one of those movies that really thinks it can get away with a lot because it doesn't think you're actually paying attention to the like the plot or what's being. Oh said. yeah, I know what it um, thinks you're t- paying attention to. That's for damn sure. Yeah, yeah. The movie yeah. is really obsessed with making Lara Croft look as cool as possible <laughs> to the point to the point where it actually like destroys suspension of disbelief. Yeah, like like there's yeah, a like point the- late in the movie. Where she is dog sledding through Siberia with an open <laughs> coat so that she can show off her her uh, tank top while everyone else is wearing like full Arctic gear because it's freezing cold out. And she doesn't immediately get frostbite. Um, and it's just, like th- th- at that point I was like, OK, movie. Okay. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Like. Yeah. yeah we've been yeah, we've the- been looking at her chest for the last <laughs> sixty minutes. The last forty minutes of this movie maybe doesn't need her chest front and center. Yeah. Marvelous though it is. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, the camera. <laughs> the camera loves Laura Croft and thinks Laura Croft is the coolest thing um, that it has ever graced its <laughs> its lens. You know, and it's just like it starts to get. Uh, irritating after a while, and it, in like you say, like it does destroy your your suspension of disbelief because she spends so much time 
you know, kind of hamming it up for the camera, either looking cool or smiling every time she takes down an enemy or every time an enemy punches her and she gets back up. And- or taking just the longest shower ever put on film. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I noticed, I put it's in just my like- notes with that shower, she's, she has her mouth open for the whole thing. <laughs> she, <laughs> she's drinking a lot of shower water. Yeah, I, I guess... Uh, water is a big turn on for everybody in this movie, including yeah. Daniel Craig, right? Yeah. <laughs> like Daniel yeah. Craig has a, has a shower scene where he is also just like, Oh, water. <laughs> so good. <laughs> um, but to the, to the camera, you know, loves her. She, every scene is her trying to be so, so damn cool. Um, I'm not, I'm not really trying to defend this movie too hard, but it's, it would be more okay. If, if they had this, like, grandiose, like, she it really is like a James Bond with, with a great rack where you're just like, like, the male gaze plus James Bond is so cool is the framing for her every time. Um, that wouldn't be so bad if any of the other characters weren't also dead set on being, like, sort of cool and joyless. Like, there's no, this movie doesn't have a lot of fun in it, weirdly. Like... No one seems to be having a good time. I disagree. I think Manfred Powell is having a very good time through this movie. He's getting back massages. He's eating grapes on his divan. Like, he's having a great old time through the first two acts of this movie. He doesn't lift a finger, which is why I was very surprised that he turned into a ninja badass in the third act, because he is just <laughs> yeah. a, pampered, yeah, yeah. a pampered, slimy jerk through the rest of the film. That's one of my fixes, by the way. I'm tiptoeing into that. I enjoy, I enjoyed the the scenes in Cambodia because Ian Glenn was basically playing hedonism bot from Futurama. <laughs> <laughs> you know? just... Like if if someone had come by and just started like drizzling melted chocolate onto his chest, I would have been like, "This tracks." <laughs> I'm not even I'm not even surprised. I, I said to Aaron that someone should be peeling grapes, and then the very next shot, there was a big uh, thing of grapes sitting right next to him. I was like. <laughs> Great. Uh, <laughs> you had to find your own fun, I think, with this film, was the, is the thing. <laughs> yeah, which, <laughs> in a movie with, that's based on a video game, it is about action and adventure. You shouldn't be working that hard to find find your own amusement. Uh, just as I'm going through my notes, another I don't know where else to put this. It's not really... There's a line where the, the computer engineer complains about all the sand uh, in Egypt... Uh, or maybe it's her. Maybe she she complains about the sand. Either way, it sounded exactly like that line from Star Wars. Where he's like, <laughs> and then I looked it up, and this movie came out a year before Star Wars did uh, that particular um, episode two, f- Attack of the Clones. Um, and I'm like, wow, you guys were a year ahead on the early aughts sand <laughs> hate trend. <laughs> Getting yeah, in ahead of the curve like on the she- sand. She says something like, uh, Egypt again, all it is is pyramids and sand. Which is like really insulting to Egypt. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Did you like? There wasn't for a movie called Tomb Raider. There wasn't a two minute, was there? I don't there think was, there was. There was two, one at about two. forty minutes. There, there okay. was two. There was Cambodia, and then there was also uh, the the forgotten destroyed city. Um, is that? Man, is, I mean, does that classify as a tomb? I think of it as a tomb as like where people uh, are actually buried. In. I think you're. I think you're being. That, then that will, in that case, I think it's some some pedantic nerd yeah. to be like, um, technically, she was in a catacomb. <laughs> in fairness, though, it takes her forty minutes into this movie to actually yes. show up and do some tomb raiding. What a what a wasted opportunity! This is again one of my fixes, but who who cares? What a wasted opportunity to have that cold open be her in a training simulation with a robot yeah. instead of. Raiding a tomb. Yeah, no, like actually I mean, doing some Indiana, like Indiana Jones. Jones. Indiana Jones like, yeah. all had the cold open where he's where he's doing some tomb raiding, and he you get introduced to Belloc in that as well because Belloc shows up and steals the thing from him, and yeah. the, you you establish that relationship right off. You could have done that with Daniel Craig's character here. She could have yeah. been raiding a tomb. He shows up and he's her Belloc, except a Belloc with sexual tension. Not that Belloc and Indy didn't have some sexual tension. <laughs> and, and you, like, boom, there's your cold open. You've got a tomb raid right off the top. You've introduced two of our main characters. And the movie somehow doesn't do that. Yeah, somehow it's like, no, we really got to show off this robot. Like, <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, weird choice. I do like that Scott's shipping Belloc in India. I think that's a good pairing. Uh, <laughs> that th- I mean, I guess the the robot thing, like that whole sequence, was like trying to be the opening of Indiana Jones with a twist. Like that was like I think they were trying to be clever. Um, uh, but the trouble is, like, it's also your introduction to uh, Lara Croft. Um, so you're not really getting a good sense of like what she's all about. She just kind of seems like a, like a, a pampered rich girl, um, just surrounded by artifacts that like, you kind of just have to take it on faith that she's gone around and, and collected these. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's, you need to, yeah, it's like that. It's a classic, you know, uh, show not or a tell not show kind of situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's so easy to, quickly slip into cynicism and and criticism um was was there anything else we like because that's sort of what where we kicked off about 10 minutes ago um like i said i like the second act uh, i also like both the big tomb set pieces both the the um the swinging log that became animated statues and the last one where i said it was a lot of like timed jumping on an orrery um fake as they kind of looked i really did i found those quite endearing those those two big set pieces uh, yeah, I think the I think the Cambodia sequence is probably the strongest sequence in the film. Like, there's some reasonable um, tension and conflicting goals going on in that in that scene. Um, yeah, I, I and I guess the the fight sequence with the sort of like rock golems um, is somewhat fun. Um, most of what was going on, I was pretty bored by. Uh, it's hard for me to really pick out a lot of um things that i that i liked um the sense i got was just kind of like i was just more kind of annoyed with how the movie presented laura croft like it kind of actually made me dislike her quite a bit because it was because it was of the over admiration of it um and I, i think because of that it also took away from just about whatever every other character was doing um uh, you know, with maybe the possible exception of, of, uh, Manfred Powell, um, who does get a, a, a few bits to, to chew the scenery, but like, like Daniel Craig is almost MIA in this film. Like, yeah. there's not a lot going on there. And they definitely, I definitely never got a sense that, um, that relationship, like, like she basically goes out of her way to, to save his, his, a life at the end of the movie, which is, I mean, she's a hero and she's going to do that. It's kind of like a save the cat moment, I guess. But like, I never got the sense that they liked each other at all or that there was any real, like, romantic tension in it. At any friendship. Point. Yeah. Yeah. The movie, yeah, like, the movie they just, th- this is a problem that the movie has in a couple places. It's a lot of tell not show. The movie never mm-hmm. shows us the dynamic with, with them. It just tells us that there's something there. Um, yeah. and, and I think this is part of the problem as well with why you found Lara Croft a little unlikable is because it's the same thing. The movie doesn't show us that she's good at stuff and that she's, uh, she's great and that she's a cool badass. It mostly just rams it down our throat. It, it keeps trying to force yeah. it without letting it happen yeah. organically. And I think that like as, as an audience member, I also was kind of off put by that. I, I pulled away from it a bit because the movie was trying too hard. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, this movie's trying very hard. I, I um, I'm really disappointed that like there's there was no uh, archaeology going on. You know, <laughs> like there was just yeah. like there was no like like I, I mean the the movie does go out of his way to show you that like she can she can fight and she can flip and she can jump and yeah those are all things that were part of the video game. But like I like you just I just never get a sense of like. Uh, how intelligent she is when it comes to um, archaeology and things like that. And uh, often that's sort of my favorite part of these movies. It isn't necessarily uh, the uh, action, but the problem solving in in uh, how things you know, come together with the historical artifacts and the history of them and stuff like that. Like those are my, those are my favorite moments when there's a sudden realization that's tied to history. Um, the, this film did seem to not want to bother with that at all. No. Uh, as we mentioned before with a big exposition dump, it was just like, mm-hmm. nope, let's get to, let's get to more Laura Croft in a tank top. Yeah, it's, there's, as I said before, there's no mystery to solve because the mystery is already solved and fed to us. 
It's yeah. just a matter of going yeah. and getting the thing. And at that point, it's not as exciting because they're just getting the thing. Because yeah. the, the stakes are now just beating the bad guys there. And we know she's going to do it because we've spent what time watching her do cool flips and tricks and reload her gun. Yeah. yeah. Well, you, you know, that's the thing that it kind of w- I found surprising is that, um, you know, the, the video game is is pretty brutal to Laura Croft. Like, uh, she takes it on the chin. When she dies, like, it's gross, <laughs> usually, right? Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, there was, there was no, none of that sort of, um, die hard, the heroes on his, uh, on his heels kind of thing, uh, at all, which I think would actually be perfect. And, like, that remake of Tomb Raider that I played is exactly like that. She's all, she's, constantly up against it she's getting the the tar beat it, beat out of her and and falling and just just trying to keep herself together with with bandages and tape how about that mo- the the more recent movie it, would you say that one's a little like shows her kind of on the ropes more uh been a while since i've seen it i think so um but it's it's also kind of it, it's it, it's also sort of an empty film like this one, um, mm-hmm. but just in a different way. Um, the way like Robin Hood was. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, they just look the, very. They look. Are we the are we talking about that the the Taron Egerton one that we yeah, reviewed? Yeah, the one we yeah, watched yeah, yeah. on this on this. Podcast. Yeah, I think that's a fair comparison. Like that movie wasn't un- unwatchable, but like, um, uh, yeah, I think the 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 newer remake just. Uh, it, it gets the visuals of, of a Tomb Raider, I think, correct. Um, but maybe the intrigue is, isn't quite as much there. Um, the reason, the reason I asked was because, uh, we were talking about, you know, the other oh, game's cribbed from, uh, Uncharted, whatever. Um, we also said this movie reminded us a lot of the Pierce Brosnan, um, James Bonds. And what did they figure out after Pierce Brosnan? Oh, show, show James Bond getting the shit kicked out of him and taking it on the chin. Um, and I wonder if maybe I was like, did they make the same conclusion with Laura Croft of like, oh, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. This movie, however, was ahead of the curve in casting Daniel Craig. So, yes, <laughs> sure, <laughs> give him that, give him that much. <laughs> um, I do want to. I'm going to point out one more good thing because what's good about us is the only time they do it well once, and they try to do it a bunch of times. This movie has multiple ticking clocks that never seem actually urgent. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Specifically the last one, I'll compliment, there is one I want to compliment, but specifically the last one where they fly a helicopter to the, the lost city that exploded. The helicopters won't go close enough. So they have to walk a bunch of the way or like take boats or something. There's some extra step. And then they finally get to this tomb and um, Powell's yelling, like, come on, the or we got to get this Ori. It'll be ready in seconds. And it's like, you guys, well, what if someone had tripped on the way there? Like, you would have missed it. It just, the, the <laughs> clocks in this movie, the number of times where you, like, they, they're really unearned, except for, again, the only part where there's any meaningful tension is when, is again in the swinging log scene, when she's like, you're going to put it in the wrong can, like wrong hole and he's like how why, how do i trust you it's like because i'm standing up here and i'm telling you you're right, gonna put it in the yeah. wrong hole and it's, there's an actual like genuine moment of tension where he's gotta like he's you see him weighing his options and he throws it and she puts it in and hooray they did it that was probably my favorite part of the whole movie because it, it felt genuinely like the the ticking clock urgency mattered yeah um but yeah like each each beat of the adventure had a different planetary alignment ticking clock backing it up where it's like, well, that ticking clock's over, but now we're under this next one. Yeah. I was confused about that because like, is it, were the planets realigning (laughs) or was it like, was it a ticking clock that the planets were about to de-align? Like, I'm not sure. I was a little unclear on that. I think it was more of the like, uh, it was, it's like, oh, one planet's aligned. Now two planets aligned. Now like they're stacking up. Oh, okay. Okay. Was the impression, which also wouldn't be how an alignment were like. <laughs> but. That's magic. A wizard did it. Yeah. I think so. Uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, Scott, you, you were talking about, um, uh, Laura's outfit in that, in that, uh, last scene, the, uh, the lost city scene in yep. the winter. 
uh, or they were in Sib- Siberia, right? Yep. Siberia. And uh, we were we were laughing at that outfit quite a bit because it looked like a like a regular Chanel coat that the prop department had literally just like glued a bunch of fur onto. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like it, look, it, it was bad. very bad and very very cheap looking. The and, whole uh, and and <laughs> the whole third act of the movie is just an absolute <laughs> mess. Like it is yeah. total oh, yeah. nonsense. the The movie unravels in the third act <laughs> hilariously, <laughs> hilariously. I, I personally uh, really loved the moment uh, where they were racing up a giant triangle to beat each other to the to the uh, triangle artifact. Uh, that that scene looked particularly uh, cheap and dumb, uh, and like you know the 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 consequences of which they weren't really clearly laid out or, or anything like that. So like all of a sudden like uh, the, a man from Powell's just like falling and going oh no, and I was like oh okay he's dead I guess, and then he he's just not back yeah <laughs> for whatever reason. So yeah. I, I guess they're time traveling, I suppose, but yeah, it's just like, I, yeah, the whole, the whole, that whole sequence was, was wild to say the least. And, uh, and yeah, very bizarre. The big globes that they were, uh, pouncing on looked very funny. Um, no, I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I think, it, I think it's just funny because like people are getting crushed by them, but they didn't yeah. seem to be going at a speed with which crushing would happen. And they looked, they looked really light too. So it didn't, it didn't look at all like, you know, if you didn't get the, the celery crunching sound effects, you would not know that that person had just met his end. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I feel I'm, I'm surprised at how much I'm going to bat for this movie because I, <laughs> but, that that was the sort of stuff, even though kind of the weird cerebral, like they both touch the time triangle and now they're in the weird, you know, time void running up the time triangle. At least like I, I kind of appreciated some of those ambitious or creative choices or just, just generally like as a concept, like they built that big stupid orrery and shot a movie on it. Like, cool. Okay. Where I kind of got the most cynical with this was like some of the dialogue is – it's not even bad. It's just like uninspired. On one point, they literally, the guys like says something about like go and shoot the bad guys, and it's like you don't call them bad guys when you're in like that's what you call them in a video game. It's just it was very tacky. And then the other one was like they're in the truck, and the, the I think it was the engineer guy is like time to save the universe again. And it was like first of all again, what? <laughs> yeah. And what did you all, do it like, last time? <laughs> what did you do? And also just the fun, like, what a, like, time to save the universe. Like, it's just, it was. That must be Tuesday. Really, yeah. Yeah. Ch- really cheesy writing that, like, a cheesy set is endearing because you can tell people tried their best. But cheesy writing is like, it costs nothing to do a second draft. Uh, mm. <laughs> I like how at the end, uh, Manfred has the loyalty of these, like, badass mercenaries. <laughs> To the point where he can like do a coup and take out the Illuminati leadership and just be like, I'm the boss now. And they're like, cool beans, guy. And then Lara beats him and he's dead. And all the bad guys are like, well, guess we're done here. And they just all leave. <laughs> like they don't they don't think for a second to avenge him or anything. They're just like, yeah, we're done here. And they all peace yep. out. Like, yeah, what? whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you on his payroll? He's not even fully dead yet. Like he just got nice. It's like. It's like someone destroyed the mothership and they all turned off. <laughs> right? yeah. Basically, yeah. <laughs> it's one of those. Well, that's the thing is like in any other movie, it would have been dead, destroy the mothership and they'll all go. This movie's like, I want that shortcut, but I'm not going to earn it. I'm just going to do it. And hope you don't notice. And it's like, no, we do know this movie. We're paying it like we're inexplicably watching this super critically 20 years after it came out. So we can podcast about it. We are watching you movie. <laughs> we see you movie um, um, to that end oh god uh, i just wanted to ask what your feelings were on the soundtrack and the and the score uh, no none <laughs> <laughs> i'm not no sure feelings. i remember it <laughs> it was mostly I, like this is part of what i think made it feel kind of 90s was it was mostly like techno music mm-hmm just you like know? cool like <laughs> yeah essentially and i don't in her Go ahead. She puts in her party mix, and it's nothing. It's not a like. It's not a cool needle drop. It's just like club music. It was yeah. Yeah, 
I just, I just don't think that like, um, generally speaking, like techno music underscoring action, uh, works, uh, really well, especially like this, this particular score, which kind of, like you said, Liam seems more like dance music. And it's like that through the entire film. Um, uh, which really kind of undercuts a lot of the action. And I think that's, I think that's another reason why I kind of felt like I was, I was bored by it. Cause it wasn't, it wasn't speaking to my sensibilities in any particular way throughout the whole runtime. Well, uh, our job uh, here is not actually to criticize though. Uh, plenty we have, um, it is to fix and, uh, I have fixes. I'm sure you guys do as well. So let's, uh, hear from our friends at the Alberta podcast network, come back and make this, a much more exciting, watchable movie. Book Women is a podcast about editing, publishing, and writing Indigenous stories. Three Métis librarians representing nations from across the homeland aim to inspire Indigenous peoples to share their stories in whatever form they enjoy. Guests include Indigenous storytellers from diverse mediums, such as podcasting, burlesque, books, comics, social media, films, music, and everything in between. You can listen and find out more right now at bookwomenpodcast.ca. Alberta Blue Cross understands that running a small business is tough, and they understand that business owners in Alberta are busy. Let Alberta Blue Cross give you peace of mind with a group benefit plan. They offer health, dental, life, and disability coverage for your employees. Alberta Blue Cross group benefit plans are easy to manage anywhere, anytime, and on any device, making it easy for you and your employees to access. I can speak from personal experience. My employer uh, provides us with a Alberta Blue Cross group benefit plan, and it's easy as heck to go in to the website, get my claims, find out when they're coming, get direct deposit, uh, personal personally can advocate it's it's easy as heck uh i I appreciate that my employers uh use it would you believe i don't podcast professionally (laughs) to to learn more and explore your options head to ab.bluecross.ca welcome back to i have some notes talking laura croft tomb raider uh guys how are we gonna how are we gonna make this a movie that cares that you're watching it. Well, <laughs> I want to start by changing Laura's motivation because again, I want to cut John Voight from the movie entirely. Uh, partly for obvious reasons and partly for structural reasons. Um, I think tying her uh, motivation to him is weird and unnecessary. I don't think you need that plot. I think it's more interesting if she's an experienced and interested Tomb Raider who stumbles into a mystery is intrigued enough that she follows along with it as Daniel Craig would put it in the movie for the glory and then realizes that there's real consequences to this particular artifact and has to make the choice herself to let it go Uh, um, without there needing to be like her dad tied into that. I think, I think you can excise that entirely and just give her the motivation. I'm, I love finding mysteries. I love finding cool artifacts I've stumbled into something that's bigger than that. I want to unravel it. Oh, this is an artifact that maybe shouldn't be recovered. And now I'm actually fighting to ultimately destroy it to prevent it from falling into bad hands. I think there's a hero's journey there. And I think that that would have been a fine character arc for her. And it would have gone from her being a glory hound who's interested in finding this thing for herself to being like, you know what? Some things maybe shouldn't be found. There's a journey. There's a journey there. Doesn't need her dad. Doesn't tie her motivation in with a man and centers the movie on her and not on Lord Dick, her dead dad. <laughs> no, I, I dig that a lot. That it, <clears throat> it also forces more creative ways of getting exposition out yeah. than just having dead dad send letters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Too late. Yeah. Yeah. Because in, in that particular structure, I mean, she's going to have to spend a lot of time, you know, in catacombs and tombs exploring and, and, uh, trying to understand what it is that, uh, that she's uncovering and things like that. You know, the, the kind of intrigue that I said in the first half, like the, the archaeology intrigue that's well, uh, so much fun in these types of movies. And I think that, that you tie that in with Daniel Craig's character too, because he's the, he's the opportunistic money grubbing archaeologist who gets hired by Manfred. So you have Alex West. Working for Manfred, but also maybe not fully understanding what he's helping Manfred find. And as Laura pieces yeah. it together, 
she starts piecing it together maybe with him. And as he begins to realize, oh, there's maybe an actual danger here, that makes his turn in the third act make a little more sense. It makes it gives them more opportunity to interact in a meaningful way so that we can dig the relationship between them. And and it adds some stakes when Manfred threatens his life, too. So, yeah. So, yeah, and I think that kind of that kind of leaves um, the way that it should have been structured, uh, where the the reveal of the Illuminati kind of comes, you know, in the midst of the third act. Yeah, you know, where where it becomes clear who Manfred is and who he's working for, and he could be kind of this guy who's like really bought into this. Um, pseudo religion. Um, you know, you could, you know, you can have a kind of like a, a reveal when they, when they get, when they finally get to the, uh, uh, to the big catacomb that, you know, a bunch of people with robes start walking out and like you get this sort of like almost seance and like there's a, there's some gravitas of like, oh, like we're, we're in sort of this much bigger, darker thing than I ever <laughs> expected, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The Illuminati have been looking for this for the last 5,000 years. This isn't some artifact. This is the artifact. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I have, and I like what you said about having Manfred maybe later, Powell, have Powell be later. I think, even just the scene where he walks in to the Illuminati meeting and they're like, do you have our artifact yet? And he's like, guys, I'm working on it. And they're like, well, we've had 5,000 years and we've left it with a week to go. We're the <laughs> Illuminati and we do our homework last minute. Go get our damn artifact. Um, if that was maybe, yeah, the reveal that the Illuminati are involved could be more significant if it was revealed in the third act, not the first. Yeah. I have I have a change for Manfred, too. Um, because for the first two parts of this movie, he's sitting in the background, like letting other people do all his work, eating his grapes, sipping his wine, getting his back massage, talking about how wonderful everything uh, he's feeling and, and how rich and, and wonderful life is. Um, I think that should be his character in the third act too. I think that when push comes to shove, he has paid goons to fight Lara Croft. And when they get taken out and she faces off against him, he should get his ass kicked like up and down. It should be a one-sided fight because he's a nonce and she is an actual Kung Fu fighter. He shouldn't just suddenly magically be able to like pull out wrestling power moves and ninja backflips because he's demonstrated none of that all through the movie. He's had other people doing all the hard work. So I legitimately think that the third act fight with him should be very one-sided and she should just like, boom, he's down. <laughs> Which would be very satisfying, too, because he's been such a smug jerk the whole movie. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Yeah. And you can give you can give him sort of, like, some way of, you know, after he gets the tar beat him out of him, he somehow gets the upper hand in some way to create some, la you know, last-second tension or whatever. Yeah, he's got goons. He's got endless yeah. goons. Well, he's that, very rich. That weirdly is, is one of my fixes, because um, I, I, I'm glad you thought he was an eccentric weirdo in the first two acts. I found he was pretty boring throughout the whole movie. The whole movie's kind of boring. <laughs> and I was like, if they're gonna, part of, like I said, they really frame her as, like, the coolest, most powerful, most sexy character with no flaws who can do anything. And as hacky as that is, if you want to keep that, because that's also kind of James Bond. They also kind of, like, 90s James Bond is like, he's cool and suave and can do anything. And, and you know, the way you juxtapose that is by having an over-the-top villain. Um, so I'm glad you thought he was, I want him up to 11. I want, you want him to go full a, hedonism, bot. go full hedonism, bot. go <laughs> full crazy bond villain. Um, and then also it, it, which is sort of what we were just discussing, but I want to say it clearly, like he's got to go over the top, have some weird affectation, be a, be a, um, a real character. And one of the things I found most egregious was at the end, they're at gunpoint and they go, no guns. And they both put their guns down and fist fight. And I'm like, that's literally just so that you can have a fist fight. At the end. There's no <laughs> yeah. reason anyone would just put their guns down to have a fun movie fist fight. If everything you guys just said where he's got goons, goons, goons right up until he doesn't, that sort of justifies him maybe trying to fight dirty. Like Greg was just saying, like he pulls out something at the end, uh, at the end, give him the upper hand. And that's a little more interesting than just a fist fight for fist fight's sake. Yeah. Uh, and you know who pulls out dirty tricks in the last minute? Bond villains. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Always mm -hmm. got one last dirty trick. And and if yeah. you want to go full Bond villain with him, 
make his make, have him uh, like have a lead henchman. Yeah. Give him give him a Jaws or an odd job whose job is to be the person who has the fist fight with Lara Croft mm-hmm. and who is built up as like a, a, a noteworthy threat through the movie. Yeah. Instead of about the sidekick would... he has, who's like a scribe or something. I don't know. Oh yeah, the weird, the weird kid who I thought was Eddie Redmayne for a while, and was like, that, that <laughs> just the out. weird librarian who's following him around, who does nothing. <laughs> I don't think he has a point. It's the uh, Laura's Croft sidekick does nothing either. It's like, true. like they make a point of like of showing you like, oh, this guy's really good with robots and stuff like that. Do robots figure in in the end? No, nope, not even a little. He's he's there. Well, uh, and does she's, he do anything? No, and she's already <laughs> she doesn't need him because she's got an Alfred. Yeah. She could yeah. have just had her Alfred helping her out. She didn't need a computer yeah. guy. Yeah. Eh, she's got two. She's got two butlers. A computer guy and a butler. And eh, that was I'm I'm okay with that. I mean those characters didn't do anything, but not even a little. Yeah. They're good. They were good. No, we, which is kind of a shame because um um that I guess his name is Bryce, right? Like that character had some interesting like little um quirks to him. Like uh he he lived outside of her mansion in like a in a camper. And just like, and I was like, oh, interesting. What's that about? And then we never learn anything about him after that. Uh, Hey, the little robots all over his apartment. He just like (laughs) slept on and walked on little walking robots he made. It was sort of both a little too cute, but I was just endeared that this guy's like, being like, I can't help it. I got to give little computer components legs and make him run around my apartment. It's just, uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it would have been fine if it had it factored in at all. Um, But I, I really just think like, I really think that he um, should have been um, kind of more of a like a, a stuck up kind of archaeologist to sort of like kind of counterbalance um, uh, Laura Croft's really go get him attitude and maybe a like reckless style, you know? She um, should have had the scribe. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I think that would I think that would have been fun that they could sort of play off of each other. That you know he's like she's 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 reckless in the tomb. She brings things down, doesn't care whatever, and he's the kind of guy like these are ancient places. You got to respect them. And I suppose that like in some ways that might uh, play into your theme, Scott, a little bit. Yeah. Um, you know, um, the other thing I'd like to see in this movie is I would like to see Laura Groff die in horrible ways <laughs> and and i think i i think i know of a fun way to do it because you know when she's down in the in the catacombs and she's gotta make um a decision about how she's going to get from you know one platform to another you can have her kind of like sort of imagine like well if i go here i go there and then like crunch like no i don't like that idea you know what i mean like she just kind of like you get to see like a visual of her imagining her own <laughs> horrible death yeah. you're like you no kind of i do, don't want to do that <laughs> you kind of do the the robert downey jr sherlock holmes thing where she's doing the mental arithmetic really sure. fast. yeah yeah exactly okay. yeah also there's a that's funny that was your poll because that is exactly what it is mine was there's a weird bicycle movie called premium rush with joseph gordon levitt where he's on a fixed gear bicycle as a courier in new york and every time he's gonna make a dangerous move through traffic the movie slows down and you see him be like if i go left i get hit by a car if i go right i hit the pedestrian i guess i go straight through and they do that a couple times that's sort of what you're describing uh premium yeah, yeah, yeah. rush if you want to see a movie do that <laughs> I, th- I think it's a really kind of like natural way of bringing in like an element of uh, the video game that that people would recognize and that would be kind of kind of fun and and uh, and interesting, you know. I kind of like that, and That's and, it, and it also sort of and it also sort of gives you an idea of you know um, how Laura Croft thinks and 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 how calculating she is. So you know, it it, it can be a little bit of a character development piece as well. I like that. i more or less. Uh, I like that as well. I kind of touched on my fixes early on, so I'll just kind of bang through them. Um, one, the, the don't, don't have them say no guns at the end. That was very cheesy. Uh, do anything else that's not that. It sucked. Um, uh, the opening, the cold open should have been tomb raiding. Like we said, especially if Daniel Craig's there, we get to see more of that relationship and she's actually raiding a tomb, not fighting a robot for no reason. Uh, the main fix that I touched on briefly, um, but, but want to elaborate on here is that that letter that the dad sends is it's really silly that she the clock starts ticking she figures out this she's got this ticking clock shows it to all the bad guys and then comes home to receive an exposition dump letter a day too late 
Um, you just, you have the ticking clock, right? It should lead to finding the letter in the same way she, like she finds the clock and that leads to the poem. If the poem just was the exposition dump, like if, if cracking open the clock is what led you to the exposition dump and then somehow Daniel Craig gets a whiff of that that letter like she loses track of it or she maybe shows it to him by mistake in a in misplaced trust Mm -hmm. um then he goes and tips off powell then when she goes to cambodia she's like who's this hedonistic guy how does he know about my letter how could he possibly know (gasps) daniel craig's here betrayal um and then you just that that, that's just that fix it was literally just that just have the letter be in the clock instead of show up the next day our version of the movie doesn't have her dad, though, so <laughs> we don't need to worry about the, the letter. There's still an exposition dump yeah. hanging out inside the clock. I think I think I like Greg's suggestion where she actually has to do a little bit of investigation herself. So maybe like just don't do an exposition dump. We don't need it. You can you can or tie action better. in with with uh, investigation. I mean, Indiana Jones does it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like I mean the the uh, the opening tomb sequence can can kind of uh, you know maybe it's a uh, it's ends up being like a piece of the puzzle, you know, to and that and that's sort of like what what sort of sets them off on their on their adventures that they they discover you know they're there for one thing but they discover something else that they weren't expecting. Yeah, and, and that, that kind of starts leading them down this path, and then that that explains why Daniel Craig was there. Because he was already mm-hmm. working for Powell, and he was looking for the other thing she found. Sure, yeah. And that gets her curious, and she decides she wants to investigate it too. And then yeah. we're off. We're off to the races. There's an initial incident for you. Perfect. <laughs> Better than fighting yeah. a robot for no reason. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think that I think that works pretty well for sure. Yeah. It, uh... <laughs> slightly more effort from this movie would have gone a long way. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think we've given, uh, given the, obviously no one can act on it, but uh, yeah, but I think we, those are, those are all sound notes all around. I think uh, definitely everything we've said here would uh, improve this movie immensely. Uh, but our listeners had uh, thoughts and suggestions as well. Thank you to everyone who commented. Uh, please keep your eye out on our social medias at, I have some notes at, I have some notes pod. If you're on Instagram, just, I have some notes on Facebook. You just put in a little search bar. It'll come up. Um, when we ask for these, please uh, share your thoughts. We love reading them on air. Uh, Andrew Craig comments, I feel like the remake went a long way to fix it. The originals couldn't figure out if they were James Bond, Indiana Jones, a superhero movie, or any number of pastiches. It's failure to pick a lane made it feel contrived and wasted any originality from the games. Yeah, I think they should have veered more Indiana Jones personally yes like you're trying to be an action adventure movie set in exotic places looking for lost treasures be a pulpy indiana jones movie like that's what you needed to lean into um i also i i thought i was really on the cutting edge by being like felt like a bond movie but i'm apparently not the only one who felt that way so uh canny insight andrew uh quit stealing my thunder (laughs) 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 <laughs> Robin from Cinematological says, it's a very 90s action movie, but the most surprising thing on rewatch is how many stunts Jolie did. Early Daniel Craig is a blank, boring page that begs, how did he get Bond? I think that's <laughs> not his fault necessarily in this movie, yeah. though. It really does feel he was kind of directed that way. Because, I mean, he's good in other movies. Like, even other movies yeah. around that time period, he's good in. So... Yeah. I don't I don't know that that's entirely Daniel Craig and his choices. I feel like maybe he was told to tone it down so that he didn't uh so that he didn't come off better than Manfred who they really wanted to be campy and so that he didn't upstage Angelina Jolie who is also pretty bland but like they really want us to know how cool she is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there just might not have been enough on the page for Daniel Craig, really. Like, it's, I don't know. Which is a shame. He, yeah. Those abs, though. Yeah. <laughs> Those abs, though. Yeah. He is, he is a handsome, glistening, showered body at one point. <laughs> Jeez, <that> chiseled <laughs> specimen of a human being. <laughs> the, the egregious 
the egregious male gaze on Angelina Jolie throughout this movie should not be understated, but I no. do appreciate that they spend a good scene being like, also look at this fucking hot piece of man <laughs> like, I, a, like a solid like five minutes of yeah. him wearing nothing but a conveniently placed statue in the foreground of the frame. <laughs> I, I swear to God that they had stuck a piece of rebar into Angelina Jolie's um bra to like create the because there's always a line between her breast and i i feel like they had done that purposely to try and mimic that kind of triangular thing that, that the original video game was known for i i just found it like i found it very strange i don't know maybe i'm yeah. just like staring too much <laughs> but like that's kind no of, they they yeah I mean, they, they i mean they made it wasn't it wasn't necessarily my choice all the time <laughs> Tack says, uh, change the first scene to an actual tomb raid fighting mummies and show Laura beat Alex on site once again. I think that's, we came to a similar conclusion. Um, Are we going to up, fighting mummies right off the bat? That's I think it just generally <laughs> tomb raiding, but yeah, that's fair to be like, start one, mummies yeah, coming out. Supernatural, fight some mummies. <laughs> you, can, you can only go up from there. You have to escalate. Um <laughs> continues uh this sets up mysticism earlier and sets groundwork for her flirtation relationship with alex um perhaps more meaningful than either care to admit yeah we we uh, also hit laura, upon that too yeah laura must return to her father's mansion to accept her inheritance it's been a year since her father's session she must settle his unfinished business and deal with the long procrastinated grief now we have a frame for the story starting no no dad yeah. get rid of the dad <laughs> tack no dad get rid john voight can kick him to the curb uh going through his old notes leads her to investigate what he was doing in his final days this is what i was saying like in the clock or whatever just yeah. she finds some of his old shit he doesn't have to actually be active uh, yeah, which, of course, yeah. reveals that MacGuffin that sets her off on the adventure, an adventure that conveniently allows her to not deal with her father's death. Interesting. Mm. If you are going to have daddy death, that's that's a fair way to add a little yeah. to it. little nuance. Uh, Tack continues, let Laura do detective work that reveals the bad guy's plan and makes him ex-Illuminati, so we know the organization exists, but it isn't that important to the story. And if you're planning on doing sequels, you've dropped that hint there, and you can have the Illuminati show up later. Mm-hmm. Um, also, oh, this was one of my, okay, I, I, I'm going to say this, obviously tax saying at first, but I, I forgot to put this in my notes. So give us more information on the tombs being raided, more setups for fun payoffs. I had the similar thought, never articulated it earlier. These are just like some tombs there's no like history to them there's no yeah yeah they are tombs in that they are holes in the ground not something significant to someone yeah yeah i think that's part of what makes a lot of the adventure really lifeless because we don't get a sense of like what it is we're seeing and and the and the awe and reverence of it yeah it's just it's just another place where another action set piece takes place yeah that's what it feels like yeah uh, Tack concludes, finally, don't infantilize her relationship with her father. She doesn't need to completely drop the tough act every single utterance of his name. Let it be a sore spot, not a cheap shortcut to on-screen vulnerability. But we don't need to have that cheap shortcut because we don't need to have her dad. Get rid of him. Get out of here, John Voight. We don't want you in this movie or any movie. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. And speaking of getting out of here, uh, that says the end of our episode. Um we did it, fellas. Uh, I really am planning on going into this season being a little less like, oh, why do we, we got to watch this? Dr-? And more like like a doctor or like someone whose job <laughs> is to fix yes. it. Like, I know it's going to be ugly. It's come across my desk. That's, <laughs> that's why we're here. My desk is for awful things to be put in front of me. And my job and our job is to fix them. Yeah, it's time um, to operate. Not, not to conge- <laughs> No, No need for... Uh, um, conjecture and and uh, opinion. And you know what? <laughs> it's, it's, it's all about get to business. I will say this too. Um, as much as we sometimes groan and complain about the movies that we watch, I legitimately have fun doing this, and oh, yeah. I missed doing it with you guys over the summer break. I'm glad we're back into it, and I'm really looking forward to getting into this season. Me too. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. With some of the movies that we've got got lined up too, I'm I'm pretty excited. Indeed. And please hit us with more. If you have suggestions for things, we, we've got a list. Uh, it's a big list, but it's also, you know, the Excel spreadsheet fits on one screen. There's no scrolling down on this list. I'd like to be able to scroll down our list of potential movies. There are a lot of movies out there, and 
at least a third of them have to be pretty middling, you guys. <laughs> yeah. I'd say it's probably more like 90% of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we should wrap this up, but I do... I, I once Speaking of video game movies, I once saw Uwe Boll speak um, at the Metro Cinema after a screening of one of his movies. Um, and someone had asked him about how his movies are in the bottom rated movies on imdb they're always like the lowest rated movies on imdb um and this is to to the point of what greg just said of like well 90 percent of movies must be tried and he makes a really he makes a really interesting point where he goes yes i am in the bottom percentile bottom 10 percent of movies that have been rated on imdb there are so many movies on imdb that have not been rated because no one saw them so he's like i take great comfort knowing that people see my movies. Lots of people see my movies. Even if they rate them badly, my movies get seen. There's people making movies that never get seen. And I always kind of like appreciated that yeah. sort of positivity on it. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and since we're talking video game movies, a new April yeah, quote. Sure. For, there's, for those who, there's for those who don't know who, who, for those who don't know who Uwe Boll is, he's kind of like a weird, I think he's German, right? Weird yeah. little, weird, yep. weird German director who uh, found a way through uh, various uh, uh uh, subsidies and things like that through the German government to get uh, get a lot of financing for films and pay for actors, and then he bought up a whole bunch of video game rights, and he became kind of notorious for making some of the worst uh, video game movies of all time, uh, which is saying something because most of them are terrible, as we very astutely uh, opened up with this episode with right so yeah, yeah uh, um blood rain alone in the dark uh, uh, Ta- blood rain, uh taxi what was that taxi one i can't remember what that one was uh, far cry he did postal he, he did a postal based on the movie right. postal i think that was the one i went and saw um in in the yeah We'll, uh, we'll bring it home here to the end. Thank you all, of course, uh, for listening. Please follow us on social media, uh, facebook.com slash I have some notes at I have some notes on Twitter at I have some notes pod on Instagram and wherever it is you're listening to this, wherever, um, you're, you're getting our episodes, please do that apps equivalent of liking and subscribing and rating. Um, maybe it's a heart, maybe it's a horseshoe, clover, blue moon, who's to say? Uh, but, uh, click that button, please. Hey, if you like adventure movies, you might also like adventure stories, and you can jump on board a new adventure story right now on my other podcast, The Read Along, a mini book club for your ears. We just started a new novel. Now is a great jumping on point. You can find it and more right now at albertapodcastnetwork.com. Uh, in two weeks, uh, Glenna Showalter returns to the show for a movie that I, I dare say our listeners have been waiting a very long time for. At long last, we're uh, taking on Ghostbusters Afterlife. So I know you guys are going to have a lot of notes for that. So please, please be merciful. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. I have a feeling that we're going to be reading a ton of them. <laughs> uh, a perfect uh, October movie. Uh, uh, there'll be a second movie in October also of this spooky variety. Mm, yeah. um, but until then, uh, I'm your host, Liam Kreswick. I'm Scott C. Bourgeois. I'm Greg Beaver. Keep watching the skies. <laughs>